Hey everyone, and welcome to Sprout Sessions. Uh, so excited to have you all here. I uh, wanted to let you know that our goal with Sprout Sessions is to bring the industry together and arm you with insights to deepen your strategy and gain new perspective on topics that are truly relevant to your brand's bottom line. We hope you can take, take away some actionable tips today and apply these practices to your social media strategy. A few housekeeping items before we get started here. These sessions will be recorded and they'll be live on our YouTube page, so you can access the recording anytime following the presentation. We would love if you could share on social media by tweeting at Sprout Social or by using the hashtag Sprout Sessions to ask questions, share your favorite bits of content, or simply follow along with the conversation. The session is only 20 minutes, but our speakers here will stick around for 10 minutes afterwards to answer any questions you have. And you can ask questions at the chat panel at the right side of your YouTube screen. All right, now let's get this session started. Allow me to pass it over to Tyler Reaver and Cubby Graham from Charity Water to introduce themselves. Tyler and Cubby? Yeah, thank you. Hey, guys. <laughs> so we are Tyler and Cubby. Uh, we both work at Charity Water, a nonprofit organization based in New York City, uh, working to bring clean water to people all over the world content brand content lead which means I have the privilege of, of traveling to visit the people we serve and telling stories about the impact of our work yeah and I work really closely with Tyler I'm our social media strategist here at Charity Water and so I handle all of our all of our social channels all right so we wanted to start a little bit uh, we're going to talk about storytelling today we wanted to start with a number that's really significant for us 663 million is a number of people on the planet who lack access to clean water. For us, it's, uh, it's a really big piece of our work. It's uh, what keeps us coming to work every single day, but telling stories around that number can be really challenging uh, because the number is so big that it's almost hard to fathom. A couple years ago, I had the opportunity to go to West Africa to a country called Niger, and I got to meet this woman. Her name is Aisa, and Aisa lives in one of the most extreme environments that I've ever had the privilege of experiencing. It's, it's about 115 degrees during the day, uh, very deserty, deserty terrain. And then worse yet, the, the process of collecting water is the most physically exhausting uh, that I've ever witnessed. So, so women come to these holes in the ground, ancient holes in the ground, and collect water by hand uh, using rope. So there's a bag attached to this rope, and they're pulling the, the water out one bag at a time. And you can see the grooves in this log in by this rope over time. So you can imagine if it's doing that to the log, what it's doing to their hands. Aisa has had 10 children. Uh, only two of them have survived. So it's a testament to the environment. Uh, but her story that she shared was one where she was collecting water with a baby on her back, uh, and she leaned in to hoist an, another uh, bag out of the well, and her daughter kicked and threw her body down into the well. So she fell about 150 feet. She hit her shoulder on the way down, broke her shoulder, uh, and really thought she was going to die. Uh, she ended up surviving. Uh, uh, people in the community rushed to save her and were able to rescue her and her baby from the well, but it didn't mean that she didn't have to come back here. So for years, she had to return to this well and face that fear over and over again. So when we talk about storytelling and trying to bring these numbers to life, uh, Aisa is, is my example. Aisa is one, one of 663 million. Her daughter is two. Their community is 550. So now when you see that number, it's less about the number and more about a person or a story. So that's our job. Cubby and I both, uh, both get to travel around the world and camp in villages and spend days uh, taking tons of questions and uh, sometimes babysitting children, just getting really close to people and hearing their stories. Yeah, and here at Charity Water, we, um, we have a mission to bring clean and safe drinking water to uh, every, every person on the planet. Um, from the beginning, we've, um, uh, that's looked a little different than the traditional nonprofit. Um, we uh, actually have a vision of reinventing the way that people think about giving. Uh, we learned that there, uh, there's a huge group of people that don't trust charity. And so we have a very unique um, uh, model uh, where 100% of uh, public donations go directly to funding clean water projects. A group of families that cover 
all of our operating costs um, so that uh, so that that can happen. Uh, we also um, prove all of our projects um, around the world with photos and GPS coordinates, proving back to our donors exactly where uh, their uh, their money is going and the people that it's helping impact. Uh, and we do all that work through through local partners um, to build uh, sustainable projects um, that they help um, uh, also maintain to make sure they continue to serve these people. Um, our uh, our work over the past ten years has now helped serve over seven million people clean water through over twenty three thousand water water projects. Um, we have water projects in twenty four different countries, uh, which all look a little bit different. Uh, Tyler, and I, Tyler and I actually uh, leave with our creative team um, tomorrow to Cambodia to go visit a little bit of the work uh, that we're doing there. So we just wanted to go over a couple of the things that are really important to our organization when it comes to fundraising and storytelling. Um, not necessarily things that we do differently, but things that we believe that really impact the way that we communicate uh, and how we communicate with our audience. The first is this idea of inspiring our audience. We, we believe in hope over guilt. We want our audience to feel powerful, not powerless. This means telling really impactful stories about opportunity. And even when we hear a story that can seem uh, negative or sad, we look for the hope uh, and, and the good that could come out of that story. So we're giving our, our, our audience a way to participate that's going to make uh, a long-term impact on health and education in these communities where we work around the world. It can be, it can be done in different, obviously we do a, t a ton of storytelling on social media, really in a lot of the digital space, but even in our galas, uh, this is from our gala last year, 400 individuals from a community in Ethiopia. We lived everybody over the age of four weeks, paired each person at our gala with a different person to witness and experience what's like not clean water from someone else's story was specifically. Uh, and then we an opportunity to give thirty dollars, enough to bring clean water to their uh, in that moment. To their generosity, we had actually sent a team to Ethiopia. So we cut live cast. It was two p.m. Metropolitan Bar, six a.m. in Ethiopia. Their responsibilities to come be part of this moment in water for the first time. Moment for the audience uh, was all about opportunity. Uh, they got to pull in that moment and turned it into a digital component quiz, uh, and we went for our audience in that room. So we made it not just about demographics. Uh, we wanted to pair you with somebody close to your age. But we wanted it to be closer to who you are as a person, the things you enjoy doing with your time, and the things you value most. So you answered these three questions and then we paired you uh, with the person in this community who is most like you as a person. And then you get to, to experience your story. But the real point here is that people respond to stories, not statistics. Uh, the faces matter, and when we can connect you, with a person and make it real through that person's story, uh, then you then you feel more powerful. This next piece is about the experience. Uh, I think the someone like you piece is, is also a great example of an experience, but we want to make sure that whether you are in our office or on our website uh, or connecting with us at, at an event, you are feeling uh, really connected to the impact of our work, uh, very inspired, again, very powerful. We have a, a kids program, a, a kids tour. So when kids come through our office, they can go through uh, sort of a set of experiences. They watch our virtual reality film, and then they get to unlock a donation and bring clean water to one person. Uh, even in the 
the books, the collateral that we designed for our staff around annual goals, uh, events, invitations. Uh, this was an RFID bracelet, so people who came to our event could participate in the evening and even give just by, by their physical location in the room. So we had an auction where all you had to do was step forward to commit to giving more. You scan your bracelet and your gift is done. Uh, we also host water walks where we give people the opportunity to experience what it's like to carry 40 pounds of water, even in Prada heels. Uh, and then we've done virtual reality exhibits uh, at Brookfield Mall here in New York City. You know, people of all ages an opportunity to watch the film and again unlock a donation uh, to help bring clean water to even more people. So we just believe that the, the closer that we can connect you to something that often feels so uh, and so foreign, uh, the more likely you are to be a part of that story. The virtual reality out at our uh, gala uh, the year before and not only shared it with those, with the people in that room, but we also took it back to Ethiopia and shared it with the little girl who inspired us. Uh, to, uh, we spent a week with her family. We got to see the to their community, uh, but we went there and got to uh, in that way as well. And for us, the, the how can, it's not always a virtual reality film, gala or activation at, um, at uh, an outdoor space. Um, but for a lot of people that are part of this, um, it's uh, probably very similar to, uh, to what I do. Um, and it can just be um, uh, through social media. And socials always played a really significant um, part of, um, of what we do here at Charity Water. Um, we've never had a, uh, a marketing budget, so, um, so socials always played a big part of that. Um, we use our social media to, uh, to celebrate our community and not ourselves here at Charity Water. And so uh, when you uh, see any of the stories that we're, uh, that we're celebrating on our social channels, it's always about connecting our community back to the impact that they've helped make possible. Um, we also use it to celebrate the stories of the people um, that have also made that that um, that work happen and, uh, you know, through um, uh, through our, our fundraising community, which we'll talk about, talk about in a little bit later. Um, but yeah, we've uh, we've social, we've used social media to launch campaigns. Um, one of our most watched films uh, this past year, we actually launched um, through uh, Facebook. Um, and just connecting people back to uh, the stories that they're helping make possible. Um, because uh, transparency is really important to us. Um, we, um, we believe uh, in innovation, using technology to, uh, to connect our community through, uh, through social media, but also to, um, uh, to connect them to the projects that they've helped make possible. Uh, so a few years back, Google for file remote sensors for our projects. So we can actually use uh, data to tell in real time how our projects are doing. Um, so um, we, can, uh, we can work through our local partners to make sure we're not just building new projects, uh, but taking care of the ones that we already have. So this is a look at a little bit of that data, which is kind of fun. Um, uh, our community gets really excited about knowing that um, uh, all of the, the work that they've helped put into making these projects possible um, continues to serve these communities uh, around the world. Um, uh, right now, our team is actually working to Sensor, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, our projects look a little different uh, around the world. Um, so this is a this is a sensor that would go on, on a tap stand. Um, uh, but um, but it's all about connecting our donors back to. Um, uh, the work that they're helping make possible. And over the years, that's looked a little different. We, uh, we put uh, Twitter accounts on our drilling rigs where they tweet their location uh, so that people can see uh, in real time how, um, uh, where our, our drilling rigs are and the projects that they're, um, uh, that they're, um, that they're drilling. Um, it's really, I think the cool part is, for years, we were a scrappy young organization, and we were telling stories about the people that we serve, uh, and we can connect you to the impact in a really real emotional way. 
but as we're getting older as an organization, we're also getting smarter and we're measuring more and we're finding ways to inspire people with the data. So it's almost this combination of head and heart because it takes both and, and just the data by itself wouldn't be interesting, but when you connect the data to a human component, you bring both to life. Yeah, um, and for us, um, uh, empowering our community is really a, a big part of that. Uh, that it's not just our story and what um, you know, 70 people in, in Lower Manhattan are doing, but it's the stories of uh, people around the world that have been a part of making these projects possible. Um, campaigner, uh, you know, college students that ride their bikes across the country, um, uh, kids that do lemonade stands, um, that make paintings, that do water walks, um, that activate, um, needs to be a part of making a difference. Uh, and this is a, a, something that we've um, kind of adopted as, uh, as we've grown and seen people do some of the craziest things to raise money for clean water is, uh, is that the craziest thing that we can do is nothing because we've literally seen people do some of the craziest things to raise money uh, for charity water. Um, Maddie's one of, uh, one of our favorites. She, uh, uh, she did this lemonade stand um, throughout the summer, even in the rain. Uh, talked a, a local band into coming and performing at her lemonade stand to help attract more customers um, and uh, has made a huge impact. Um, uh, Jen uh, makes these totes to bring clean water to people in need, um, hand sews them. Um, kids like Noah who, um, who are getting their schools involved in making a difference. Um, we've had uh, church get involved. This is a group in uh, Berlin uh, that does a 5K every single year. Um, they've been supporting us since Charity Water was like two years old, um, uh, running with jerry cans on their back uh, and raising over $100,000 for clean water. Um, but uh, it's really, really remarkable to see um, these incredible, inspiring people from around the world um, uh, using their creativity and their passion um, and uh, to really help make a difference for people around the world. Part of what's been really fun, we, we've known from the beginning that it's not just our story, right? Our founder, it began, at, Charity Water began for him on a, on a trip where he got to see the need firsthand and he made it his story, but by sharing it, he started to make it other people's story as well. So when, we've had over a million people who have now joined us uh, who've made clean water part of their story. And it's amazing to see how those stories start to inspire other people as well. Uh, we even have had incredible brand partners uh, who are finding unique ways to empower their audience or share the story uh, and make it their own as well. This one comes from a brand called Lokai. You've probably seen the Lokai bracelets. Um, a, uh, like a, met, a chat bot, uh, a little girl in Ethiopia who could who can answer questions and tell you about her experience uh, living a life without access to clean water. Our friends at Nautica have done these awesome in-store installations, shared virtual reality, uh, and just continue to introduce their audience to the water crisis. Others put on their own water walks and hosted events where they tried to make the experience real uh, for an audience as well. One of the latest ones from Emergency, uh, they created the 40 pound challenge because the experiences uh, of carrying water is 40 pounds of water. They asked their audience to take a picture of themselves holding 40 pounds of whatever they wanted. So it could be a, a small child, it could be four bowling balls, it could be uh, free weights. We saw hundreds of these uh, people participating, trying to get a sense of Lots of bags of dog food. It was a really popular one. <laughs> yeah, it's my. It's truly my dad's only Instagram post. I love it. And with the stack of books. <laughs> For us, it comes back to this number, and it's it's so much more than a number to us. Six hundred sixty-three million stories, uh, individuals like Aisa uh, in in Niger, but it's also Molotani in Malawi. Uh, little girls in Nepal um, who are waking up at 3.30 in the morning to go get in line to collect water from a source that dries out so quickly uh, that you just have to stand in line and wait. 
uh, and then remarkable families uh, like Lajillam and Alem Sahai who live in Ethiopia, who we've seen uh, clean water impact and uh, and seeing the trans the transformation that happens for them and their family for opportunity and earning extra income uh, and just having a, a completely new story. So that's um, that's a little bit about us in Charity Water and our approach to storytelling. We would love to answer some questions or, or talk more with you guys. Wow, that was really an amazing presentation. Thank you so much, Tyler and Cubby. You really uh, told us a lot of great stories about people in need of clean water. Um, so with that, we do have some questions from the YouTube chat. And I did want to note that, um, you know, we did have a, a little bit of struggle here with, with technology. So thanks, everyone, for bearing with us. If you have any questions about any of the sections where they might have cut off, uh, please feel free to use the chat box to ask those questions and we will be following up after this presentation with the full deck so you can see the full presentation there. Uh, so Cubby and Tyler, uh, the first question here that we have from Judith Thomas is, do you get written permission from everyone you feature on social media and how do you get them to agree to be featured? <laughs> Judith, bring the hard questions. Yeah, right out of the yeah. Gate. We uh, we reach out to all the individuals. We we often have an existing relationship with the supporter, so um, they're often somebody that um, uh, somebody from our supporter experience team is uh, in conversations with and helping them run their fundraising campaign. And so, yeah. So when we're working with them, uh, we're reaching out um, and and making sure that we have. Um, permission and they're often thrilled and really excited um, uh, um, to share that with our larger larger audience. Yeah, and on the beneficiary side, when we travel, we there are a couple different parts of the process, but every time we enter a community, we sit down uh, and have sort of a formal introduction where we explain our purpose uh, and our intentions and how we're gonna use any of the content we're gathering. We're very, very invested in because we want, we want because they want to build communities like theirs. Uh, and, and often it's the same. People are very supportive. Uh, and we do consent forms there as well. Uh, and just try to be very, very explicit about how and where we're sharing their stories and content. That's feedback. Yeah, communication is definitely key there. So through those um, stories that you're telling, these personal connections that um, people have through your social media content, how do you turn those connections into actual donations? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, for us, um, we, uh, we really like to use our social media channels to connect people back to their impact. Um, so a lot of that community is um, um, has fundraised for Charity Water, or maybe they give uh, monthly to uh, to the Spring, which is our monthly giving community. Um, and so we really try to use our social channels as a way to celebrate the impact that they've helped make possible. Maybe that was through a birthday campaign that they did a few years back, um, but. Uh, just as a, a daily opportunity to really inspire them um, uh, with the impact that they've helped make possible. And another question from YouTube chat. Um, so with um, all of that social media content, do you have specific KPIs or are you um, strictly going for the donations? Or rather focusing on yeah so we don't have any um, any KPIs around donations through social um, uh, they're primarily around uh, engagement and audience activation um, so we look at um, uh, like people that are sharing about their campaigns on social um, and uh, and more around the engagement and so um, uh, so we don't have like a, a direct um, target it's more of a for us we really see social as a as a brand experience um, for our community, uh, like I mentioned, really just connecting them back to the impact that they're helping make possible um, and inspiring them to continue to make, uh, to be a part of making a difference. Absolutely, that's really great. Um, another question from YouTube chat, this is kind of an evergreen question, right, that every social media marketer has. Um, it's how do you combat the declining reach um, of content on Instagram and Facebook uh, without necessarily allocating the budget to reach more of your organic audience. Ooh, that's a really good question. I um, I'm not sure if I have the answer for it. Um, uh, 
Um, yeah, do you have any? The question is about reach. Yeah, and growing the audience. Yeah, can you repeat the question one more time? Sure. It is how do you combat declining reach on Instagram and Facebook without mm -hmm. allocating more of your budget to reach um, that organic audience that has already followed you? Oh, that's yeah. It. yeah. Well, I guess for us, we we've never had a a, a a budget for paid social, and so it's all really been organic for us. Um, and so, um, so I think, you know, we kind of um, uh, try to learn from uh, what we've done, what's really resonating with our audience organically, um, and then put more time and resources behind building, um, uh, building more of that content. Um, so one thing that's been really, um, uh, you know, doing well for us on social recently is um, is 360 content um, and sharing 360 videos from um, the field and and uh, you know whether that's in a classroom um, setting uh, where kids are now able to go to school and spend less time walking for water or um, or getting 360 video from uh, maybe from like their water source or uh, or the tap stand where they get get water from um, so uh, so for us I think it's it's um, we're just always trying to keep learning um, from uh, what uh, what's working with our audience and what people um, engage with the most um, and so every week we we actually have a meeting where uh, where we talk uh, and look through what um, what worked well last week um, what um, you know what people were really excited about seeing and then we try to build more into that um, and lean into um, uh, more of that content for that audience yeah and I think part of part of the reason we do that is is trying to figure out how to, to beat the system, right? So because those numbers are going down, uh, we know that if we can create more shareable content, uh, we're likely to get in front of, of a larger audience. So it's it's a little bit of like weekly A-B testing to see what what's more shareable and what can extend the reach for us. Absolutely, that's really great advice. Um, and speaking of that great content, that video content, uh, how do you budget for video? And do you have any advice for people who are shooting video remotely with limited equipment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're, we're really fortunate to have a group of uh, investors, really, who support our operations costs. So Cubby introduced this 100% model earlier. Uh, that's only possible because of this group of 117 families who, who pay for uh, all of our operations costs, trips to the field, electricity, Wi-Fi, uh, pizza parties, everything. Uh, and they, you know, they believe so strongly in our work that they're willing to invest in video projects, uh, knowing that it's a really compelling part uh, of the way that we share the story. I think for younger organizations or organizations with less, less money to put into it, you have to, you have to be willing to, uh, you, you need to know in advance how you're going to prove the value uh, and then prove it one video at a time. I think if you can if you can argue or gain a budget to go shoot one video and you know exactly how you're going to show the impact, uh, then you can make a case for making a second video and start to grow your library of content that way. That's great feedback too, thanks. Um, so we have time for just one more question here. Um, so it's from another YouTube chat. Um, how does storytelling on social media differ for the next generation as opposed to targeting people uh, maybe from some older demographics? Oh, I mean, I think the biggest one is like, it's, it's changing every day. We don't know. Uh, and that's part of the fun is that we are constantly experimenting with new technology or new ways of telling the story. It might be virtual reality, it might be augmented reality, it might be Instagram stories. Um, there's certainly a difference in the amount of uh, investment of our, <laughs> of like how much we're willing to, how much time we're willing to spend watching video or how focused we are really, right? You're now watching a video while you're also on your phone or in the middle of a conversation so it's very, it's a very distracted audience, and I think uh, it's part of the challenge, telling telling a really powerful story quickly uh, or in brand new ways. But that's that's the fun part. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, obviously, a lot of people look to Charity Water's expertise, so thank you so much for sharing all of these insights with us today. Um, on behalf of Sprout, I wanted to thank you all for attending this session, and thank you so much to Tyler and Cubby. You guys really rocked it. Uh, keep your eyes peeled, everyone. We're going to compile some of the major takeaways from this session and share it with you all afterwards. You can feel free to continue the conversation on social media using the hashtag Sprout Sessions. And all of us at Sprout, have a great summer. Thank you guys. Thanks, guys. For